So educational neuroscience is an attempt to use new findings that are emerging from neuroscience about the mechanisms of learning in the brain and to understand how they may be translated uh, into implications in the classroom to improve educational outcomes of children. Now, to understand why educational neuroscience is relevant or important or new, I think we have to step back a bit and think about what we're trying to do in psychology, in the field of psychology. So in, in psychology, we're, we're basically trying to understand how the mind works. Uh, and uh, there's a, a bunch of reasons we might want to do that. We might want to predict how people are going to behave, change how they're going to behave. Definitely in the classroom, we want to understand uh, how to teach children, how to give them skills, how to give them knowledge, how to turn out uh, good citizens for the economy. How do we understand how the mind works when all we can see is people's behavior from the outside? We have to figure out what's going on inside their minds. All we can see is behavior. Well, what we do is we use a, a standard scientific approach. We try and infer hidden causal entities uh, uh, mechanisms that we can't see based on the overt behavior uh, that we see in adults and, and children. And so we've been pretty good at doing that. We uh, uh, come up with things like uh, working memory and attention and perception and emotions and things like that. The drawback is that as scientists, it turns out that we don't have very good imaginations. When, when it comes to thinking about what might be going on, uh, inside uh, um, people's heads. What we tend to do is think about the technology of the day and think about that that might be a good kind of metaphor for what's going on inside our head. So you can trace this back through history. Uh, you can look at the idea that the mind works like a steam engine, that was a Freudian idea, or that the mind works like a telephone exchange, or that uh, memory works like a hologram. I think the most recent version of, of this type of uh, uh, mechanistic uh, metaphor of the mind is the desktop computer. We think that maybe the mind works like a desktop computer. Uh, and if you think about that, just the, the phrase working memory, that's exactly the same phrase that we talk about keeping things in mind and we talk about a computer, that it has working memory. I'm upgrading my computer to 10 gigabits of working memory. The problem of thinking of the mind in terms of the workings of a desktop computer is that's not really paying attention to how the brain works and, and what the brain finds easy to do and what it finds hard to do. And this is part of a broader picture as, as uh, we are getting a, a deeper understanding of brain function. We're beginning to see the influence of neuroscience in multiple different areas. So uh, in areas such as uh, uh, affecting understanding of economics or understanding of law, or understanding uh, uh, security, these kind of things. There's a range of wider influences of neuroscience. So with the uh, rise in understanding of how the brain functions uh, and the emergence of the field of neuroscience, we're beginning to see a wider influence of neuroscience on different areas within society, including uh, how neuroscience impacts on economics, how neuroscience impacts on law. Now, the area I work in is the impact of neuroscience on education, trying to understand how uh, brain mechanisms of learning constrain how children learn, what they learn, how quickly they can learn, and what things we can learn at, at different ages. So as I work in this field and I'm trying to do this, this transfer of neuroscience research to education and to be guided by educators and what the key questions are in neuroscience, some things strike me about teachers. So uh, first off, uh, Teachers are the experts in the classroom. They've got years of experience. They have a, an intuitive feel for what works uh, with children. But they don't have a training in the mechanisms that underpin learning in children. And that's an interesting comparison, say, to, to doctors who would have a extended training in how the body works before they sit down with a patient and, and diagnose a, a disease. Now, there's been a long history of accumulation of knowledge uh, in teachers about what works in the classroom, but that kind of trial and error accumulation of practice, what it sometimes leads to is, is fashions in education. 
techniques that, that uh, are used one year, but a decade later you're using something different. And it also lets in the possibility of techniques in education that really don't have any evidential base. So the idea of bringing in a deeper understanding of mechanism underpinning learning and conveying that to teachers uh, is an attractive one. The other thing that strikes me about teachers, uh, at least in the UK, is that they're very excited about neuroscience. They're enthusiastic about it and implicitly that suggests they understand the importance of, of mechanisms of learning as one aspect of knowledge that should uh, inform their practice. Indeed, they're so enthusiastic that, that sometimes they embrace what's called neuromyths, misconceptions about how the brain works. For instance, that some children are left brain thinkers and some children are right brain thinkers or that you can't pay attention in class unless you're drinking lots of water. So uh, some people say this attempt to translate from neuroscience into education can't be done, that those two disciplines are too far apart. That, that we're taking activity of brain cells and looking at the connections between neurons or perhaps we're using magnetic resonance imaging to see what parts of the brain are more active. Uh, and at the other end we've got a classroom full of children who are running around and the teacher's trying to get them to sit still and learn something. How, how can those two things uh, match up with each other? Well certainly the translation between the low level of neuroscience and uh, actual effective techniques that will work in the classroom, that's a big translation. There are a lot of steps between it about taking new findings from neuroscience and seeing whether they have educational implication uh, and then seeing if there is an apparent implication, say for how many times you might repeat material in certain ways to, to make sure that it's best learned, can we actually put that in a form that it's going to be useful to teachers. But there are people who say it can't be done, that really the proper academics, the proper scientists that, that teachers should be talking to are psychologists and, and not neuroscience. And I think that there are some risks about that approach. If you ignore how the brain works and you just stick with psychology and these constructs we've come up with, particularly those based on the way a computer works, I think you can, there, there are things that, that just make no sense. Now, let me give you some examples. So why is it that uh, I can forget, I'm trying to learn French vocabulary and I, I, learn, I learn French vocabulary and I forget it a few months, a few years later, but I don't forget that I'm scared of spiders. Why is that? Uh, why is it that uh, after a good night's sleep I seem to be able to remember what I learned yesterday better? Why is that? Why is it that teenagers all of a sudden start making risky decisions and, and uh, uh, trying to impress their friends? Oh, what happens there? Uh, why is it that I seem to be able to new, learn a new language better when I'm five years of age than, than when I'm 50 years of age? All, all of these things have no basis in, in understanding what a computer does. Uh, another example, why is it that I do lots of learning on my topic, I sit in an exam and I'm really stressed and suddenly my mind goes blank. Uh, all of these aspects, uh, things like uh, phobias, things like uh, sleep, things like puberty, things like aging, these have no basis in uh, uh, how a computer works. Computers don't get stressed. So there's a lot of aspects that, that appear within children's behavior, children's learning, that we won't get any insight into unless we understand how the brain is working. So here's one of the, the big puzzles in teaching. When you teach uh, a child, an adult, a given skill, they just seem to get better on that particular skill. It's really hard to find activities that you can do that will make people better at everything. In fact, sometimes people seek these like, like they're a holy grail. Like you'll hear uh, work that says um, meditation may make you better at, at everything. Uh, learning a musical instrument may Im improve your intelligence. But these are very much the exceptions and mainly when you learn something, you train on something, you only get better on that skill. So the question is why is teaching, why is it so specific in its effects? And this is something again that really makes no sense uh, in terms of, of, of the idea that the mind is working like a desktop computer. The desktop computer is characterized by general mechanisms. 
general mechanisms in terms of a central processing unit, in terms of a hard disk, in terms of the working memory, or these days in terms of the cloud. These are mechanisms that process all the kind of content. And you would have thought if you trained your central processing unit, you would get better at all the processing you do. Well, the brain doesn't work that way. Its content is built into specialized circuits, specific circuits. And that's why if you improve, if you strengthen the connections between the neurons in one circuit, it doesn't transfer to the strength of the connections in other circuits. Of course, you've got to think how a system like that is going to work with all these specialized components. This one for vision, this one for hearing, this one for decision making. What you also have there is a control system, one that will activate the right circuits in the right uh, context and inhibit the wrong ones. So. The goal of education in that framework is to try and see how we can put the right specialized content into the right systems, but also uh, to train the controlling system, the controller, to make sure that the right parts of, of the system are activated in the right context. And of course we have to uh, bear in mind that the brain is the seat of the emotions as well, and it's important for children in the classroom to have the emotional stability and security and behavioral regulation to be ready to learn in the classroom. So the big message of educational neuroscience is it is early days, the brain is a very complicated thing, education is very diverse in its goals, but as we understand more about brain mechanisms, there are uh, strong hints that we will be able to transfer that into lessons for uh, learning in the classroom. So uh, some of the areas where educational neuroscience has, has made the, the biggest strides is understanding the, the brain circuits and the functionality of skills such as learning to read, uh, such as mathematics, such as doing arithmetic. These areas are interesting because uh, children raised in an environment without education just wouldn't learn those brain structures. So we have this extended special environment of exposing children to uh, letters and written forms and pronunciation and reading and the comparison of reading to pictures and scenes and scenarios that gradually cause our brain structures to build parts of, parts of the brain that will be specialized for reading words. So there's a visual word form area in the brain and that has certain properties. And that's only come about by spending weeks and weeks training children in these culturally determined environments. And the same goes for mathematics. We're understanding about how we represent size, how we represent symbolic number, and what happens in children with developmental disorders like dyslexia or dyscalculia that may limit their ability uh, to learn those aspects. A good example of, of how you might uh, transfer from an understanding of, of neuroscience to what it might mean in the classroom uh, is the example of, of learning about science. Now what's interesting about science is in many cases scientific knowledge overwrites our intuitive uh, knowledge about how the world works. Let's take a six-year-old boy. Uh, he learns in class that uh, the world is round, it's a sphere, it's a curved surface, uh, but for all of his six years he's been running out around and for maybe two years he's been playing football on the football pitch. That doesn't look curved, that looks flat. So how does that child go about learning that the, the earth is a sphere where his everyday experience says it's flat? Well, one way you might think is you just overwrite that old knowledge and you put in the new scientific knowledge. Neuroscience studies of expert scientists, when you put them in the brain scanner and see what's happening in their brain, it turns out that what they're doing is actively inhibiting their intuitive knowledge and activating their scientific knowledge. And what makes them an expert is they're better at inhibiting irrelevant intuitive knowledge. So that gives us a hint that one of the skills that might help children learn science is helping them with this suppression or inhibition skill. And there's, a, there's actually a, a technique that we're evaluating here at the Centre of Educational Neuroscience in London where we're training children in the area of science, these are eight, nine, ten-year-old children, to learn about uh, these counterintuitive ideas in science and, and to suppress the irrelevant counterintuitive knowledge. And, and we believe that this will help them acquire the broader topic of science uh, and it's a technique we're, we're currently evaluating. So one possibility about very intelligent individuals is that they have very good 
inhibitory control skills, the ability to, to really shut off knowledge, intuitive knowledge, everyday knowledge that is not relevant to the very technical fields where they're becoming expert.